Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our February online lecture event. We are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering at the University of Toronto. We host monthly guest lectures. My name is Mohamed Jalir. I'm the CSC manager. Today, we are pleased to feature Dr. Mohamed Bashir from the University of Toronto. First of all, I'd like to go through the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Hurnwandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still to home the many indigenous people from across the Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. If you are new to our guest lecture series, welcome. We are the Center for Climate Science and Engineering, which is a research and education center within the Civil and Mineral Engineering Department at the University of Toronto, and it was established in 2019. The CSE consists of a diverse and multidisciplinary team of faculty members who collaborate on interdisciplinary research at the intersection of climate science and engineering. Our center's director is Oyamar Jan, and she focuses on structural analysis. Daniel Paulson focuses on life cycle assessment. Ahmed Ibrahim has recently joined our team, and he works on hydrologic variability and processes. Karen Smith focuses on atmospheric science. Mohammed Bashir has also recently joined to the team and he focuses on hydrology and water resource systems. He is going to give a presentation today. Paul Kushner looks at climate dynamics. Sam Marco from the University of California, Merced, focuses on sustainability and resilience. And then me, the CSE manager. So, one of the primary initiatives undertaken by the CSE focuses on providing education in climate science and engineering. We have developed and launched two graduate level courses at the University of Toronto. Additionally, we have created eight online learning modules that are now accessible for use across higher education institutions in Ontario. We also design and run two courses through the University of Toronto's Deep Summer Academy for high school students. Furthermore, our faculty members are engaged in collaborative research projects at the intersection of climate science and engineering. Also, our team organizes outreach activities just like this one, where we invite the public and university community to give a presentation on topics that are aligned with the mandate and vision we have at the center. Now, I'd like to introduce today's guest lecture speaker. Dr. Mohamed Bashir is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at University of Toronto. His research is on water resource system planning and management, focusing on hydropower planning and operations, water resource economics, and the water energy food nexus. He uses interdisciplinary approaches to address a socially urgent question, how to plan and operate sustainable infrastructure in water resource systems, considering engineering and socioeconomic aspects to provide water, energy, and food services while addressing future environmental, technological, and socioeconomic uncertainties. To address this issue, Dr. Bashir and his group developed analytical frameworks for designing efficient infrastructure, operations, and policy interventions in water resource systems. Dr. Bashir leads and was involved in research and consultancy projects in various regions worldwide, including North, West, and East Africa, South Asia, in the Middle East and Europe. Current and research collaborating organizations include the World Bank, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, European Commission, and the International Food Policy Research Institute. He's going to give a presentation on navigating climate uncertainties in the Neo Basin through cooperative adaptive operation of large dams. Dr. Bashir, welcome. Thank you for being here today. We are very excited to learn more about your presentation. Now, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Mohammed, for the introduction. And um, thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today and to share some of the work that we've done over the past few years about the Nile Basin and how we um, try to address climate change uncertainties um, through um, infrastructure planning, like dams. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay, so um, 
So today is um, what I'm going to talk about today is the Nile, the Nile Basin, um, and um, I will give a quick introduction about it in a bit. But um, but the idea here is um, there's a lot of negotiations about how to manage the Nile water resources between the riparian countries of the Nile River. Um, on top of that, there's climate change, which um, we know that's going to affect the system, but we don't know exactly how it's going to affect the system. So there's uncertainties and and, and then the question is how to manage these uncertainties um, when negotiating uh, uh, water resources management plans. And what we're trying to promote and show here is that, you know, a recipe in which you have cooperation between countries and at the same time you have this acknowledgement of the of the need to adapt to climate change. So um, uh, in which we can no longer commit to fix plans and, you know, have like a plan for how to manage the water resources and all your dams and infrastructure for the next hundred years, but rather come up with a, a, a strategy and then also, you know, a mechanism for how to adapt that strategy moving forward. Uh, so that's that's why we call it adaptive. Um, so before before we start, I just want to give a shout out to my um, to the co-authors of this paper. We've, we've been collaborating on this work. Um, uh, we collaborated on this work for something like four years. And um, this is a very inter interdisciplinary team of hydrologists, climate scientists, economists, social scientists. And uh, um, it, it was a challenging thing to try and bring all of these disciplines together. But in, in the end, we were able to produce some um, some results that we think are quite valuable. If you want to read more about this work, feel free to, to, um, to access this paper. Um, so today I'm going to cover three main things. I will give a quick introduction about the Nile Basin in, in, in case you're not familiar with that part of the world. Then I'll talk about the technical aspects of the planning framework that we came up with to try to address these uncertainties in a cooperative and adaptive way, in a way that considers engineering dimensions and economic dimensions simultaneously. And then we'll finish with some concluding remarks. So just looking at this this map, it's, it's quite fascinating because it, it shows the you know, the dams that are around the wall, the, the ones that are existing right now and the ones that are um, um, planned or under construction. So the red dots are the existing dams and the green ones are planned or under construction dams. And these are not all dams in the wall. These are large dams. And a large dam is defined by the International um, uh, Commission um, on Large Dams um, is defined as a dam that has a height of at least 15 meters or storage capacity of 3 million cubic meters. So these are really not all of them, but these are the big ones. And why these big ones are important is because they can affect river flow significantly. And um, when you build a dam somewhere, um, of course, you build it for a specific purpose, whether it's um, generating electricity or providing water for um, irrigation or domestic or industrial water needs or um, flood control or uh, navigation, different purposes. But um, when you build a dam, by definition, you change the flow of the river downstream because you want to regulate the river flow to be able to produce these benefits. And downstream water users might benefit and they might also be negatively affected. And that's why planning dams is a very complicated issue. And rivers by nature, they don't follow political boundaries. So you can have one river starting in one country, flowing into another country, and then into a third country, uh, maybe even more. Um, and then um, building a dam in the upstream can affect all of these countries together. Now, that's one way, that's, that's, that's one dimension of this complexity, but also, um, Climate change is there, yeah, and, and you know, countries they want to to come up with agreements, and for a country to have some security in terms of water resource security, they they need to to have a binding agreement that um, can help them um, plan for the future. But then we don't know how climate change is going to affect this system. So by nature, we should not really go for plans that are static. Any agreements or any ways to manage water resource systems should be inherently adaptive in a way that enables us to adjust as we um, go over time and learn about climate change and as, as the future unfolds. So these are basically the two things that we're trying to address here, the complexity of water resource systems and transboundary water resource systems. And then on top of that, climate change, um, its impact on the system and the fact that we are really uncertain about how climate change is going to impact um, the system. 
let's talk about the Nile. So the Nile is actually one of the longest rivers in the world. Um, it has a length of around 6,700 kilometers. That's quite quite long, yeah? Um, it's Many say it's the longest in the world. Others say the second longest. It depends on how you measure the length. But in any case, it's one of the longest rivers, either, either first or second. The area of the of, of the of the watershed of the Nile Basin, this is the area here that you see um, around the river. Um, it covers 10% of the area of the African continent. Um, that's around 3 million square kilometers. That's quite large. I mean, compared, you know, to give it some context, the area of Canada is 10 million square kilometers. So, and this is 3 million square kilometers. So it's a very large basin. Now, it's it's the the managing the water resources of this river is quite complicated because you've got eleven countries involved. The, the the watershed of the of the river goes over eleven countries, and you see them here on the map. And there are five hundred million people living in these countries. Um, in terms of geography, um, there are two main tributaries or three main tributaries to the river. There is one called the White Nile, and um, which contributes around twenty seven percent of the Nile flow um, measured. At the Egyptian border, um, and it's called the White because um, its water is clear; it doesn't carry a lot of uh, sediment in it. Um, we've got the Blue Nile, which starts from the Ethiopian highlands and um, contributes sixty percent to the Nile flow. And it's called Blue because the, actually the word Blue in Sudan means muddy, um, so th that's why it got this this name Blue Nile. But the water is not actually blue; it's quite muddy. Um, but it contributes quite a lot to the Nile flow. It's 60% and it starts from the Ethiopian highlands. And then we've got the Atbara River, which uh, contributes around 13%, also starts from the Ethiopian highlands. Then the combined flow goes northwards um, through the Sahara Desert, and then in whatever is left of it ends in the Mediterranean Sea. Now, um, as we can see here from this map, I mean, you can see uh, in, in the you know, background map. The, this part are a little bit, a little bit green, going north of Africa. It's a, it's quite dry. It's a desert. So most of the Nile water comes actually from the upstream part, from Ethiopia, and then here from this area called the Equatorial Lakes. Um, so a country like Egypt, it doesn't contribute much to the flow of the river, but relies on the river for ninety-seven percent of its flow. And if you just look at the geography um, of the of country like Egypt. Um, uh, most of the population, over 90% of the population, is just living on 4% of the area of the country. And that area is around the, the Nile River. So this is how significant that river is for Egypt. Um, and any changes to this river is going to be quite significant to Egypt and would concern Egypt. Similarly, Sudan is, is kind of a little bit in a little bit better position compared to Egypt. There is a, a little bit more rain, more, var more varieties of water resources here in the southern part of the country. Um, um, but um, going to the north, is, it also gets dry, and there's also high dependence on the river water resources for irrigation and for different purposes. Um, at the same time, um, if we look historically, um, most of the Nile water um, is being used by Egypt and Sudan. And, um, and most of the water is fully committed to these countries, so they have users that are using this water. But quite recently, upstream countries are developing economically and they're starting also to use the water, which is creating um, tensions between the riparian countries. One of these large projects that you know dominated the media for a long, long time um, is called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. This is located here where the, you've got this uh, blinking arrow. Um, it's located near the Ethiopian Sudanese border on the Blue Nile which contributes 60%, if you remember. Um, so it's, uh, it, and, and it's quite a large dam. It has a, a storage capacity of 74 billion cubic meters. If, if, you know, that's equivalent to around 1.5 times the mean annual flow of the river at that location. In simple terms, imagine if you build this dam and the dam is there and, you know, and it's completely empty. There's no water stored behind the dam. If you close all the gates of the dam, for a, for a year and a half, no water would be flowing down the stream. So that's how large this dam is. And remember, Sudan and Egypt depend a lot on this um, on this river. The dam has a storage capacity of 5,150 megawatts. That's going to be the largest hydropower facility in Africa when completed. It's nearly completed now. The construction started in 2011, and now it's really nearing the, the final stages.
Um, and that's quite significant for Ethiopia. I mean, in Ethiopia, you've got a large proportion of the population still without access to electricity, more than 50 percent. And uh, the dam is going to double the overall electricity generation of Ethiopia. So it's quite significant development project for the country. But again, th th that created also some issues for Egypt and Sudan. Uh, for a long time, um, the, 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 the countries have been negotiating and trying to reach an, an agreement, but nothing um, has been um, uh, uh, reached yet. The capacity, the, the power capacity of the dam, 5,150 megawatts, just to give you some context, one of the a very large dam currently under construction in Canada is the um, Site C dam. And um, it's, uh, uh, it, it has a, a power capacity of 1,100 megawatts. So and this is 1,550, so it's, it's quite large. Um, Global is going to be the 10th largest. So it's, it's a very, very big dam from a hydropower capacity viewpoint. Now, the idea of this dam is not new. These are some screenshots from documents from the 1980s. And, um, and even these documents cited some documents from the 1960s. Um, so the idea of the dam was all this was one of the dams proposed to, in one of the studies, um, it was called at that time the border dam, and it had a, a storage capacity of 11 billion cubic meters and a hydropower capacity of 1,400 megawatts. Um, it's a dam at the same location of the current dam of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam at the current location of this dam, and um, uh, but the design has changed. Yeah, it was quite small, um, but now it's quite large and has a, a lot of control over water. That's why it's causing a lot of tension. Some history again about the, the dam. If you look at the um, some of the milestones in the in the history, I mean, I mentioned some some studies from the 1960s. This was a study done by the U.S. Um, United States Bureau of uh, Reclamation um, um, for the Ethiopian uh, government at that time to 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 show them the uh, um, a project that can be built on the river. Um, construction of the dam started in 2011. There were some attempts to try and reach an agreement between the countries by forming some technical committees. Um, in 2015, there was a signature of something called the Khartoum Declaration. This was signed in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, listing some principles for how the dam should be managed. But again, there, was, there wasn't success in moving these principles from just principles to technical details of actually how to manage the dam. Another milestone was 2019 to 2020, the United States administration hosted some negotiations between the countries, um, Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Um, and these negotiations were, um, uh, you know, they, they see a picture um, of the three ministers of foreign affairs of Sudan, Ethiopia, and Egypt at that time with the uh, president of, um, of the United States at that time, Donald Trump. Um, Still, the negotiations reached a very, very advanced stage, but collapsed at the end. Ethiopia did not agree to the outcomes of the negotiations, and no agreement was, was reached. But for me, this is a milestone because this is for the first time in the history of the dam that a technical proposal was made public. It's out there in the internet. You can go out there, download it, and see what the countries were negotiating on with all the engineering details. And this is um, uh, an amazing thing for an engineer and a researcher, something to play with, yeah? So for me, this was a, a, a huge, a huge step forward. Um, and I, and I would be referring to this proposal quite a bit in the, in the rest of my presentation because, um, um, we simulated it and we tried to see how it performs under climate change. Now, quite recently, 2020, the, um, African Union tried to put the countries together and try to get them to reach an agreement, but nothing happened. There's no agreement until now. The filling of the, the initial filling of the dam started, which is a very significant process because you need to fill the reservoir of the dam and um, before you can um, use it for hydropower generation. And the filling is now nearing its final stages and still there's no agreement. So that was a, a little bit of a history about the night. Hopefully now you're you're a little bit familiar with why this system is quite complex and and what's at stake there. Um, now, for us, we wanted to try and come up with solutions. Yeah, We wanted to propose something that considers climate change, that brings the countries together, and um, and um, and uh, basically considers the complexities within the, within the system. And we came up with this framework, which has basically three steps, one, two, three. They don't happen in this order, one, two, three. They could happen 
in, in any order. We could start from the engagement or from the search. Um, but um, here I'm, I'm going to explain them from one to three. So in the simulation um, phase, we built a simulation model which captures uh, the infrastructure in the river system, the water users of the river system, and um, the economies are also that rely on the river system. So uh, we use the economy models, we link them with engineering river infrastructure models, and we try to see if we change something in the river system, how is the economy going to react? How is GDP going to change? How many people are going to lose their jobs and so on? And, and, and that's quite useful because that way you can communicate quite effectively with uh, stakeholders. Now, um, simulation models are complex, of course, and you know you can you can simulate a thousand scenarios. There is no way you can know that these are the best scenarios out there. Yeah, that's why we try to use a search um, approach in which we link the simulation model to search algorithms that can help us identify the best um, interventions that can be um, implemented in, in the river system in a way that improves the performance for everybody. Then the, the third step is engagement, is just to try and talk to stakeholders, build their capacities on using these models, try to get them to tell us how wrong our simulation model is, how bad our search is, and then we try to, to get them to improve. And, you know, um, and together with them, we work on improving these, um, the model and the search. Many things go into these uh, three steps. In the simulation, we get economy models, we have river system infrastructure models, we get hydrological models to try and turn climate change impacts into um, hydrological impacts, into river flows, so that we can look at how dams are going to be affected and how water users are going to be affected. And of course, we have climate change projections here to drive the, all the systems. In the third step, we use AI search algorithms. Um, and basically, if these algorithms, when you connect them with a the simulation model, they can, and, and you define a certain formulation for that search, um, process, um, you can have the AI algorithm tell you the best ways in which you can change how the system is operated, how infrastructure is built, how infrastructure is filled, and uh, in terms of in, 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 in the case of dams, of course, and um, and then um, you can take these plans and discuss them with, with, with the stakeholders. There's also machine learning for trying to understand some of the complexity in the system to understand some of the interrelationship chips and data patterns that, that come out of the simulation model. And then with the engagement, as I mentioned, we, we organize a lot of capacity building events and um, we try to get feedback from stakeholders and have them help us improve the simulation models and search uh, formulations. And all of these steps, they happen, as I said, in, in an iterative uh, process. And the idea is that in the end, we hope to come up with some adaptive intervention plans um, that can help the countries move forward considering climate change um, in a collaborative way. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about each of these three steps and um, and how we implemented them. So in the simulate step, we try to basically connect two main things, um, river system infrastructure on this side and economy system on that side. And the way these are connected is an iterative way. So. The, the, these simulation models, they run over time. So you could run a, a river system infrastructure model that capture dams and irrigation schemes and water users and all of them. You can run it over the next 50, 60 years and you can drive that simulation by climate change. Yeah. At the same time, you can do the same with economy models. You can run them over time and you, they can be driven by the socioeconomic assumptions behind climate change scenarios. But then these models affect each other as well at the simulation time step. So they talk to each other every year because the economy models are annual. Um, river system infrastructure models, in this case, were monthly. So we had the models talk to each other. Um, and the way that works is the economy tells the biophysical engineering model um, how demands of the economy are changing in terms of electricity and, um, and, and investments. And, and then the river system infrastructure based on these demands, tries to supply water and electricity and then constrain the economy based on the physical constraints in the system so that the economy doesn't just assume that everything is available all the time. No, it, it is constrained by, by how the physical system works. Then we've got climate change projections that drive both of these models. So uh, we use 29 CMIP6 um, climate change projections um, to drive this simulation. So the simulation are run over multiple scenarios um, to consider this uncertainty that comes from socioeconomic pathways 
and also um, different climate change models. And, and these climate change scenarios are a combination of um, socioeconomic pathways that are underlying these um, scenarios and also the radiative forcings. Um, and this climate change scenario, they affect the river system infrastructure. So you've got, you know, different projections for how populations are going to uh, change under different socioeconomic pathways, how economies are going to perform under different socioeconomic pathways, and so on. Um, so, so the idea was to come up with a coherent framework in which all models talk to each other and use the same kind of data um, um, from climate change projections. Then we, we also, of course, river system, when we talk about rivers, water is important, but we need to translate precipitation and temperature and all these changes um, into river flows and water demands. And, and that's done through hydrological systems models. And in this case, we used a, a model called VIC and another extension of that called RAPID to route river flows. Um, and in the end, end up with having river flows that go into the river system infrastructure model. Um, but also climate change is going to affect the demands, um, the agricultural demands, of, you know, for irrigation, for example, in that region. It's going to affect the amount of water that evaporates directly from open water bodies. And this can be quite significant um, changes in uh, water that's leaving the system. And that's also fed into the river system um, infrastructure model um, to be able to consider this in the different climate change scenarios. Um, then we've got all of these shocks that come from the assumptions that underlie climate change. And there are so many simulations and data that were done by IASA and CEPI. These are organizations in Europe and um, that can be used to drive economy systems models and, and river system infrastructure models. But the idea is overall, we wanted to have one coherent framework that use the same underlying data of the socioeconomic pathways, the radiative forcing, radiative forcing and um, to drive all simulations simultaneously. So this is how a river system infrastructure model looks like. So you start from a system like this, you turn it into a network of nodes and links um, um, that are connected. And in this particular model of the Nile, it has 210 nodes, including inflow nodes where water is introduced into the system, abstraction nodes where water is taken out of the system, and reservoir nodes. And, and these are basically dams or natural lakes that are also simulated. Of course, one of these dams is the Ethiopian dam, which is here, the one you see here next to the sudan Ethiopia border. And you've got also another very large dam here in Egypt called the High Aswan Dam, which I will talk about in a bit. But, um, but the idea is these simulations, um, the, the model was driven by the 29 climate change scenarios that I mentioned earlier. And the model runs from 2017 to 2100 until the end of the century. Um, before using a model, of course, you need to make sure that it works. Um, it, it, we went through the, the well-known model calibration validation process that is used in hydrology. So you take an independent period of time, you try to fix model parameters, and then you test them on, in a different um, period of time. And these are different location in which the model was um, performance was tested. So here is the observed data and the simulated data. And we can see that model performance is quite acceptable. And this can be also seen here by these performance metrics that are ranked based on um, well-published criteria. So we are quite confident in the performance of the infrastructure model and to use it for um, for other studies for for you know for to address our problem. Now to simulate the economy, we used economy-wide model. There's a class of models called computable general equilibrium models, and we developed a model for Ethiopia, a model for Sudan, and a model for Egypt. And why? Because the Ethiopian dam is going to impact these countries. We didn't develop model for the rest of the Nile Basin countries because they are not affected by this dam. And then we, um, to build the model, we used the tool or our standard CG model from the International Food Policy Research Institute. It's quite uh, a very popular model used to, to to simulate a lot of developing economies. So it's uh, it's very suitable for this region. This is how, in general, an economy-wide model looks like. Um, in terms of interactions, of course, there are so many mathematical equations that govern this kind of models, but basically you have um, different actors within the economy, governments, households, and production activities, the rest of the world, and all of these actors, they interact with each other based on um, financial transactions. Yeah, And what we have within the economy is within these activities, a sector for agriculture, irrigation, a sector for hydropower, and a sector for municipal water supply, a sector for um, um, industrial water supply, and so on. And these sectors are shocked 
by the river system infrastructure model, depending on the availability of resources, but they also inform the um, the river system infrastructure model about changes in in the demand for water, energy, and food resources. So that's how these models are integrated and they work together as they progress over time. Okay, so these are this is just some of the outcomes from the um, the climate simulation. So here, these these points here, these are the the results from the 29 climate change projections. This is the end of the century uh, precipitation change over the Nile. Um, here, uh, end of the century temperature. When I talk about end of the century, this is the last 30 years of the, uh, the, of the century, so from um, 71 to 2100. And then the color is the change in, in, in the flow of the Nile. And we can see there's a very wide range of uncertainty within climate change projections. You, there's no way you can come up with one plan that can work for all of these possible futures. Uh, the best way to deal with this is to be adaptive. Yeah, it's to be able to come up with criteria that enables you to change things as the future unfolds. Um, at the same time, for economies, the underlying assumptions behind each SSP that you know that drives each climate change projection also has different futures for economies for, of the countries. If you have a very if you have an SSP assumption that results in a very large economy, let's say for Ethiopia or Sudan or Egypt, then any change, any external shock is going to have a large absolute um, effect on the economy. If you have a small economy, shocks on it is going to pr produce smaller uh, absolute impact, but in terms of percentage, they might be large. Um, so also these SSPs have their implications for economic performance. And the idea is to try and to do this in a coherent way. Okay, so that was the simulation framework. That's how, that was how the system was simulated. But then, okay, we built all these fancy models. What did we want to do with them? Um, so remember I talked about the Washington proposal, and that's the proposal where we had it out there, published with all the technical details. So we wanted to start from this Washington proposal. So that's something the countries negotiated on. They were close to reaching an agreement. Of course, things collapsed in the end. But we wanted to stress test this proposal against climate change uncertainty. And then we wanted to see if by using the simulation model and we using by using the search algorithm, can we actually propose something better than the Washington proposal uh, through an adaptive strategy in which countries collaborate? Um, there's a lot of literature out there about climate change adaptation and how you adapt your infrastructure to uncertainties in climate change. Um, a very well-known approach is called the dynamic adaptive planning. Um, um, and this was uh, developed by Quackle in 2010. Um, in which you don't actually commit to a fixed plan. You commit to, you design a short-term um, plan, but you um, you also need to, to come up with an adaptation mechanism, yeah? So you say, okay, for the next five years, we're going to do this. But then after that, we have this criteria in which we can look back at the end of these five years and change things in a way that improves things for the next years, depending on what we've learned over the past five years and how climate change has already affected the system. Because as we progress over time, uncertainties about, about climate change are gonna, are, are gonna decline and we should be able to adapt to that um, 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 decline in uncertainty. So through adaptive uh, planning, we can tackle the uncertainty of climate change, but we can also tackle the uncertainty of socioeconomic uh, systems because we don't know how countries' economies are going to perform. We can make guesses, but we don't know exactly how things are going to happen. So what 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 does that mean for dams? Yeah, we've talked a lot about the problem. We've talked about a lot about what we want to tackle. But for the Nile system, we talked about this dam, which is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam located in Ethiopia, and we also mentioned this very large dam, the High Aswan Dam, which is located in Egypt. And the challenge in managing very large, two very large dams on the same river is that you have to coordinate how they're operated. And, and, and we looked at this in, in three different kind of problems. So first of all, we finished building the dam. Yeah, or we're building it. Yeah. And then we want to fill it up. Yeah. So well, before starting to use the dam for the actual purpose, you need to fill it. But then as you fill the dam, yeah, because you'll be stopping some water from flowing downstream, the water level of the dams in the downstream would 
potentially go lower. Of course, it depends on the hydrologic condition. It might go low, it might not. And that's why we have that uncertainty. Now, what, what if it goes very low? For Egypt, they have this um, very critical level, the 60 billion cubic meter storage. If it goes below this, what we suggest is Ethiopia slow the filling down a little bit, try to help Egypt go through that period. And then as the hydrology improves and how we have more water in the river, then Ethiopia can start filling again. But then again, a lot of questions come here. Yeah, how much Ethiopia should, how much water should Ethiopia release if Egypt, um, if um, the highest one dam water level goes below sixty? Yeah, and how do we also measure that critical level if the highest one dam goes below sixty for one day and then goes back up? That, does that mean Ethiopia needs to release water? How long should the highest one dam remain below the sixty billion cubic meter level? before Ethiopia can trigger some help, yeah? And these are very valid questions, technical questions. Um, imagine trying to answer these without knowing uh, what, what the future is gonna look like in terms of climate change. Now, the other context for the problem, imagine the, the, uh, the, the Ethiopian dam is now filled and is ready to start working. The Egyptian dam is above 60. Um, then in normal operation, the Ethiopian dam will be fluctuating within a normal operation level. But then the Ethiopian dam itself, it needs to have some kind of critical level. If the water level goes below this critical level, the, the, there's need to be some changes to the operations. Normally, if the dam is in the normal operation level, you try to generate a certain amount of power. That's called the normal power target. But then we need to have that critical level. If the water level goes too low, Ethiopia needs to reduce that power target to be able to recover, yeah? But what is that target? We don't know. We have to design that, but we try to design it under high uncertainty. Then the, the other problem is during normal operations, if the high Aswan dam goes below its critical level, yeah, we need the Ethiopian dam to help a little bit to try and release water to, to, um, to help Egypt. But then the highest, the, the, the Ethiopian dam cannot release water until it's empty. There should be also a critical level below which the Ethiopian dam wouldn't help Egypt anymore. Um, and that also brings more questions. How much water should uh, Ethiopia release? Yeah, What is that critical level? And how many days should the highest one dam be below the 60 billion cubic meters before help is triggered? And all of these are complex problems. I mean, this is a big, big river system with so many users trying to figure out the exact numbers and designs for these um, uh, system operations is quite complicated. But in, in the end, what we want to do is, is to try and come up with what economists call Pareto optimal solutions. So if we imagine we've got Egypt, some, some objectives of Egypt here, some objectives of Ethiopia here or Sudan here, yeah, there are endless, almost infinite ways in which you can operate the system because you've got all of these combinations of different parameters, different ways in which you can operate dams and, and, and uh, different ways in which you can define, you, you can de define rules. And you can end up with all of these values here in the solution space. But what we're ultimately looking for is these red points. This is called the Pareto frontier. Yeah, it, engineers, they call it non-dominated solutions. Um, and uh, because these are the best solutions out there, of course, there is still trade-offs between objectives of one country and the other. Um, there could be also some alignment in, in some cases, but um, we need to figure out these red points. We as researchers, we as en engineers or scientists, we cannot really tell the countries which of these red points they should um, select or follow. Um, what we can do is give them these red points and get them to negotiate. At least they would be negotiating on something that makes sense. They wouldn't be negotiating on these um, non -do these dominated points. Yeah, and that's the idea from the search uh, process. Um, so this is the second step: the search, in which we try to look for these red points in the solution space, and then provide these red points to um, to the countries through publications or through direct communication with the countries. Now, how, how, how that search process works, you remember we had the simulation step in which we've got all of this um, integrated simulator. Um, we connect that to a multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. This is a, a class of AI algorithms that you can to connect to simulation models, but you can tell it you have this set of decision variables. You have these decisions that you can play with 
um, to try to achieve some objectives. And then you let the simulation and the search algorithm um, iterate with each other thousands of times until they find these red points for you. Yeah, so they, they move from very bad solutions. These are the very blue points on the far right side, all the way to the red points to help you find the best set of solutions or the minimum set of trade-offs between objectives. And that's what we tried to do. So we had the simulation model here. Um, we linked it with the search algorithm, and then we tried to find these red points. Now, these are the results of all of these four years of, <laughs> of, uh, of study. Um, this is the fascinating plot, but I'm going to explain it now. This is called the parallel um, coordinates plot. And the way you can read the parallel coordinates plot is you imagine that you've got an X and Y this way. So you've got a normal scatter plot. And instead of having your axes perpendicular to each other, you can put them parallel to each other. And instead of having points, the value on each axis, you can connect it to the corresponding value in the other axis with a line. Yeah. So instead of having points like this, you, you end up having lines. Why is this beautiful? Because whenever you see lines crossing each other, that means there is trade-offs. If you see lines parallel to each other, that means these two objectives or metrics are quite aligned with each other. Now, if you go back to our plot here, we can see it's the exact same thing. Um, you've got the axes here. And the beautiful thing about this axis is that you've got economy metrics. So this is uh, the change in the Ethiopian GDP, in the Sudanese GDP, the Egyptian GDP. But at the same time, we've got our classical engineering metrics that are hydropower generation in each country or from different dams, irrigation water needs and, and water use in, in different countries. What this plot, I mean, each of these lines is one line on that Pareto front. But now we're not dealing with a two-dimensional Pareto front. We're dealing with a, um, in this case, a nine-dimensional plot because we've got nine objectives that we considered in that optimization process. And the black line you see here in the middle, this is the performance based on the Washington proposal that I mentioned earlier. Anything above this line, that means we're improving um, the performance compared to that proposal. Anything below, that means no, the performance is not as well as the Washington proposal with respect to that specific metric. Yeah. So the idea is if we can find the line that is above this black line um, for all metrics, then this is a good line. We can tell the countries, oh, we found something that better than what you actually negotiated and something that works better under climate change. And so how, how this is how we, we, we try to, to look at these, um, these solutions. So we've got each of these gray lines is one of the solutions. Um, we've got um, a, a design that would be favorable for Ethiopia. It will improve the benefit of Ethiopia, the maximum in terms of economy. But that's we're gonna reduce the performance of Egypt quite a bit, and that's a strong trade-off here. We've got a, a scenario that works for Sudan is gonna reduce the benefit for Ethiopia a little bit. It's gonna reduce the benefit for Egypt a little bit, and then we've got a scenario that is we consider a compromise in which we improve everybody a little bit, make everybody a little bit unhappy, and that means this is a a, a good compromise solution, but still performs better than the Washington proposal. Remember that all of these solutions are tested. So this performance that you see, this is the average across 29 climate change projections. And, and then we've got all of these um, parameters in operating the dams. And we've got a five-year interval in which after each five years of simulation, we would look back at climate change. And then we adapt how these parameters are, um, th their values in the simulation models, basically. So it's an adaptive way. It's cooperative because countries help each other in times of um, of need. Now, if you take each line and kind of open it up a little bit behind each line, there is performance for each. So these are the 29 climate change projections. These are the years. This is, for example, the performance for Sudan. And each of these columns here shows one of the Pareto optimal solutions. Um, and then here, how GDP changes compared to the Washington proposal under each scenario, under each climate change scenario in each year. Yeah, for the next, this is 25 years, yeah? So you can see definitely here, if we have a scenario that is favorable for Egypt, because here we're looking at Sudan's GDP, we're gonna have bad performance for Sudan in terms of GDP in many climate change um, scenarios here. But then a compromise would help everybody uh, balance things out across um, different scenarios and also for different countries, yeah? 
Now, now the, the, the last and third step of the um, of the framework is engagement. And we, we're always out there with stakeholders. These are some of the events that we organize. This was a, a training session that I, I, I led in, um, in Sudan. This was in 2022, um, where we have um, engineers and economists um, taking part in, in some of these training sessions. This is the session that we organized in Jordan, in Amman. And um, we had also um, participants from the Nile Basin countries and also participants from the Tigris and Euphrates Basin, which is another very um, contentious um, river basin. And um, yeah, and the idea here is to try and, you know, train um, the uh, stakeholders and using these models, but at the same time, um, have them help us improve them and, and give us feedback about how to get the model to work better. So conclusions, because I think we're, we're reaching the end here. Um, so three things that I really want us to take away here. Um, we need to consider climate change in um, water resources negotiations. Normally for negotiations, you know, you know, there is, you know, you countries try to reach something that is fixed, uh, that gives them security, something that's legally binding. Um, and, and there's no problem with that, but we need to make it adaptive. Yeah, it, it cannot be fixed. It has to be something that you agree on. And then you also agree on a mechanism for how to change that over time. Using multidisciplinary metrics can really help integrate research into policy making. You, you've seen that we've got some dollar numbers there, um, the integrated models, the economy, the engineering. And I've, and I've been in a room where I present to, to stakeholders and decision makers, and they don't really pay attention when I talk about all the hydropower numbers and stuff. But as soon as they see the dollar numbers, they really start paying attention to, to the impact because this is the language they, they, they can understand easily and they, they're, they're happy to discuss with you. They also using this in the interdisciplinary metrics can help in, in some contexts, of course. But then finally, it's important. Stakeholders are part of this process from the beginning to the end. You can't build a model and bring it just, you know, for stakeholders to take it and use it. That will never work. This has to be a continuous process in which there is continuous um, discussion and um, feedback um, from both sides. And there is capacity building so that models can be used afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, again, if you would like to read more about the paper, feel free to. And um, I look forward to any questions or discussion.